Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome you to this uh, scientific platform. I'm Dr. Hisham Salahuddin, Professor of Cardiology in Cairo University and the President of the Working Group for Dyslipidemia and Atherosclerosis. And we will be talking today about statin therapy in atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. We are all aware of the importance of LDL cholesterol in the development as well as the progression of atherosclerosis. And we know that LDL cholesterol is implicated in endothelial dysfunction as well as the formation of fatty streaks and the progression of atherosclerosis. And we know as well that atherosclerosis is the major underlying etiology in patients having ischemic strokes, coronary artery disease, as well as peripheral vascular disease. And looking at the different risk factors contributing to the development of myocardial infarction, we will find, according to this data that was published some years ago in The Lancet, that cholesterol is actually one of the major attributors to the development of myocardial infarction. And this is a very nice uh, slide showing some very interesting data. We know that although it's a vascular tree, but actually the contribution of the different risk factors for the development of atherosclerosis in each and every vascular bed differs according to the site of this vascular bed. For instance, this lipidemia is an important contributor and major risk factor for the development of carotid as well as coronary artery disease. It may not be that important for the development of peripheral vascular disease, but at least triglycerides are actually important. Also, if we are talking about, for instance, uh, carotid uh, atherosclerosis, we'll find that hypertension is a very important and very um, impressive uh, risk factors for the development of carotid atherosclerosis and ischemic strokes. And we know for sure that if you're, for instance, having uh, atherosclerosis in some vascular bed, you may be having some other vascular beds as well having such atherosclerosis. That's why don't be so astonished that part of the assessment, for instance, of an operation for, or a procedure for an abdominal aortic aneurysm or a thoracic uh, aortic aneurysm and atherosclerotic uh, involvement of such uh, vascular bed, that you have to be assessing as well the coronary circulation. And these are some interesting data from the REACH registry. And the REACH registry was one of the largest ever done registries on atherothrombosis. It involved almost 68,000 uh, patients who had either coronary artery disease, peripheral vascular disease, coronary artery disease, or at least three risk factors. And one of the more important that it was actually involving more than uh, 40 countries, 44 countries to be precise. And I was actually um, very honored to be part of the researchers involved in such uh, registry. And the data were quite clear. 25% of patients with coronary artery disease have atherothrombotic disease in other arterial territories. Almost 40% of patients with cerebrovascular disease have atherothrombosis in other arterial territories. And strangely enough, 60% of patients with peripheral arterial disease have atherothrombotic disorders involving other arterial territories. So if you're having one vascular bed having some disease, you should be expecting that some other vascular bed may also be involved. And if you're having one vascular bed involved, you are at a risk. But you're having more than one vascular bed involved and having polyvascular disease, you're definitely at even a higher risk. And in spite of knowing that cholesterol is implicated in coronary heart disease mortality, and data as old as the seven country studies were quite impressive because it showed us clearly that there is a, a clear relationship between the level of cholesterol and the development of coronary heart disease mortality. Actually, the good news came from a meta-analysis of 38 primary and secondary prevention trials with more than 98,000 patients involved. And it was also clear as cholesterol is actually important for the development of coronary heart disease and mortality from the disease. Also, getting your cholesterol lowered down was also 
quite impressive in reducing such mortality. And we are having different trials. Different trials talking about how you lower your cholesterol, whether we're talking about primary prevention trials as the WASCOP or the ASCO trial, or secondary prevention trials as the lipid in the care trials, the HPS, and different other trials, all talking in the same direction. The lower you get your LDL cholesterol, the lower will be the coronary heart disease events. And what applies for the coronary artery disease also applies for the stroke. The more you reduce your LDL cholesterol, the more will be the reduction of ischemic strokes. And actually, meta-analyses are also confirming such theories. Actually, it was shown from different studies whether talking about trials with an arm on lipid-lowering statin or another arm on a, or two arms, one of them on a high-intensity versus a lower-intensity statin, all talking that whenever you get your LDL cholesterol lower and lower, this is better for the patient and will reduce his uh, outcome, bad outcomes regarding vascular events. And actually, it was shown from such meta-analysis that if you reduce your uh, LDL cholesterol by 39 milligrams per deciliter, this is a one millimole per liter, this would lead to a relative risk reduction in events of 22%, which is quite impressive. So what further evidence do we have? In the Jupiter trial, this was a very impressive trial. Why was it that? Because they, it included actually patients having no prior chronic cardiovascular disease or diabetes, where men 50 years of age or older, or women 60 years of age or older, having an LDL cholesterol which is below 130, but a high sensitive C-reactive protein of two milligrams per liter or more. And the patients were, after a four-week running period, were randomized to either resolve a statin 20 milligrams versus placebo, looking for a primary endpoint of myocardial infarction, stroke, angina, cardiovascular death, or the patients to undergo cabbage or PTCA. So it was a very large trial, a very innovative trial, including almost 18,000 patients, and the patients in such trials did not have at baseline neither coronary cardiovascular disease nor diabetes. Looking at the data over 12 months, we'll find that LDL cholesterol was significantly reduced by 50%, HDL cholesterol increased by 4%, and triglycerides reduced by 17%, while the high sensitive C-reactive protein was significantly reduced by 37%. And this was translated to a reduction in the primary composite endpoint of 44%. And this was quite uh, significant as shown in this p-value. 44% relative risk reduction in such patients having no baseline cardiovascular disease or diabetes who were treated with a statin versus placebo. And the patients had an LDL cholesterol, just to remind you, below 130 milligram per deciliter LDL cholesterol and a high sensitive C-reactive protein of two milligrams per liter or more. And this was the primary endpoint. Other secondary endpoints, if we are looking to the secondary endpoints, included myocardial infarction, stroke, or cardiovascular death, which were also reduced by 47%, or arterial revascularization, hospitalization for unstable angina, which was also reduced by 47% quite impressive results. But if we go, on the other hand, to patients having stable coronary artery disease, or what we call currently chronic coronary artery disease, we'll find that the data from the TNT, which included almost 10,000 patients, and actually the LDL cholesterol went down in the atorvastatin 80 milligram arm to 77 milligram per deciliter versus the 101 milligram per deciliter on the atorvastatin 10, and this actually was translated to a relative risk reduction in the high intensity arm of statin of 22% relative risk reduction in the cumulative incidence of major cardiovascular events. The same was seen also in the time to first fatal or non-fatal stroke, which was also reduced by 25% in favor of the high intensity statin. And then came another landmark trial the PROVE-IT trial, the TIMI-22. 
And this, pa this study, which included more than 4,000 patients having acute coronary syndrome, they were either randomized to either pravastatin 40 milligrams versus atorvastatin 80 milligrams for a duration of almost two years and looking for a primary endpoint of death, myocardial infarction, documented unstable engine requiring hospitalization, revascularization 30 days or more after randomization or stroke. And what did we find? LDL cholesterol in the high intensity atorvastatin arm was reduced more significantly by approximately 49%, reaching a level of 62 milligrams per deciliter versus 95 milligrams per deciliter in the lower intensity pravastatin 40 milligram arm. And this was translated to what? Simply, it was translated to a significant 16% relative risk reduction in the primary composite endpoint of all cause death major cardiovascular events, or um, so it was the death or major cardiovascular events reduced in the atorvastatin 80 milligram arm versus the pravastatin arm. Another very impressive trial was the miracle trial. And why was it impressive? Because it was a relatively short term study. And it was shown in the 16 weeks uh, of randomization that atorvastatin 80 milligram in such patients led to a reduction of 16% in the atorvastatin 80 milligram, uh, having an LDL at the final uh, visit of 72 milligrams per deciliter versus the placebo arm, which was actually having an LDL cholesterol of 135 milligrams per deciliter. And if we have been talking about coronary artery disease and acute coronary syndrome, as well as we were talking about uh, primary prevention as seen in the Jupiter trial, but we also have some very interesting data regarding stroke mortality and stroke reduction in patients given statins. In this interesting meta-analysis of statin trials and stroke mortality, we'll find that uh, some of the trials actually showed, like the Sparkle for instance, showed some good results in reduction of stroke mortality uh, in patients having uh, risk. In the SPARKLE trial, they were comparing as well atorvastatin 80 milligrams versus pravastatin 40 milligrams in over 4,700 patients. It was a very large trial, including more than 200 uh, sites worldwide. Patients had to have previously documented stroke or TIA within the previous six months with no history of coronary heart disease and their LDL cholesterol levels had to be 100 milligram per deciliter and less than 190 milligram per deciliter. And they were looking for a primary endpoint of time to first occurrence of fatal or non-fatal strokes. In this trial, one of the secondary endpoints was major coronary events, was, which was actually reduced by 35% in favor of the high intensity statin arm. Uh, Primary endpoint of time to fatal or non-fatal strokes was also reduced by 16%. And actually, this was statistically significant, also still in favor of uh, patients taking high-intensity statin. Carotid antitrectomy in such patients having carotid stenosis was also reduced in the trial by 56%. We have to say clearly that the net benefit was in favor of using statin, although there was some increase in the hemorrhagic strokes in patients taking statins. However, the net benefit went in favor of giving the patient statin. What about peripheral arterial disease? These are some interesting data from the effects of intensified lipid lowering therapy on long-term prognosis in patients with peripheral arterial disease. And we can see here from this data that it is clear that if you're giving the patient statins, the outcomes, uh, freedom from cardiac death to be more precise, was actually better in patients who were given statin tr treatment versus those who were on no statin therapy. And they concluded from this study that higher doses of statins and lower LDL cholesterol levels are both independently associated with improved outcome in patients with peripheral arterial disease. And some other data, actually there are many studies on this uh, issue, including that cholesterol reduction with atorvastatin, for instance, improved walking distance in patients with peripheral arterial disease, 
And here they were testing the uh, differences between the 10 milligram versus the 80 milligram atorvastatin over placebo. And they were checking whether the uh, walking test, the minute walking test, was improved or not. And it was actually shown that it did improve whenever you gave the patient statins. But there is always this question that we are always uh, being asked about. Are all statins the same? Are they alike? Are there differences between them? Or is it just a class effect that we should be giving any of them? Of course, there are differences. There are differences in pharmacology, so this should be translated in differences in outcomes, at least in some points. For instance, we can be seeing here from this systematic review and meta-analysis of therapeutic equivalence of statins that there are some of them which are high-intensity statins, uh, having uh, a significantly more reduction in LDL cholesterol, like resuvastatin, for instance, is actually uh, giving the, 40, the 20 and 40 milligrams of resuvastatin, giving uh, a more significant reduction in LDL cholesterol, as well as the 40 and 80 milligrams of atorvastatin are giving actually uh, excellent results regarding reduction of LDL cholesterol. There are also some differences regarding the pleiotropic effects of statins. Although we stopped almost using this terminology, but still we know that there are some effects that we can be expecting from statins beyond their LDL lowering effects. Some of them related to uh, decreasing coagulation, some of them related to uh, reduction in platelet activity, some of them related as well to improvement of endothelial function or increasing the nitric oxide bioavailability or reducing reactive oxygen species and different other mechanisms, including anti-inflammatory effects and so forth. So there are actually some other effects that we should be expecting from statins, and these effects may differ from one statin to another. There are also some differences, although they commonly share side effects, and there are almost no significant differences between the different um, statins regarding their side effects, but some of the patients who take this statin uh, are feeling side effects. If you shift to some other statin, this side effect may disappear. And also, you may be finding some differences between the statins regarding doses. Sometimes the small dose will not be improving, will not be causing side effect, while higher doses will be showing some side effects. But in general, the side effects of statins are usually uh, not that uh, much. They are actually rare to occur, except of some muscle aches, but of course some of them are actually fatal, like for instance the occurrence of uh, myoglobinuria or uh, the muscle symptoms. Having just muscle pains is, uh, should also alert us to do a total CK level and to further investigate the patient. Another important question that we commonly ask ourselves, when can I see the evidence? I'm giving the medication, so when should I be expecting the evidence? And is this the same for all statins or not? Actually, there are some statins showing a very early effect. For instance, here are some interesting data on a statin that 90% of the LDL cholesterol reduction occurred within the first two weeks of treatment. Quite impressive results as seen here in the chart. And actually, the benefits were there seen in most of the studies like the ASCOT lipid lowering arm in three months, and the CARDS benefits appeared within six months, Greece same, Miracle within four months, and the prove it within 30 days. But they're not all the same. Some medications are actually showing the estimated time to benefit as late as uh, 18 months or 24 months, so they are not all the same. Some statins are showing earlier response and some others are showing some later response. But mind you that some of these differences may be related to the type of patients included in the study. So this is also one of the points that we should uh, think about. How long should I take the statins? Actually, this is a very difficult question because we are being asked this multiple times. Am I going to take this medication for life or not? And usually our answer is that depends on the condition. And also, we are talking about the current guidelines. Maybe in some years there will be some differences. So how long should we take it? The answer depends to a great extent, of course, that 
we should be knowing the safety of the medication. But we know from the 4S trial, for instance, that we had some uh, safety data up to 10 year follow up of the 4S trial. And also from the WASCAP trial, we have already 20 year follow up of such patients. And the benefits are there in most of the trials, while the side effect profile uh, actually is something we have to put into consideration, but we also we have to weigh the benefits versus the risk. So one more question, is there a risk of discontinuing statins? Actually, there is a risk. And these are some interesting data that was published some years ago, showing the event rates of those coming in to hospital with no statins versus those who were on statin and continued on statin, or those who actually had the worst prognosis who came in on statin and they discontinued statin. These were the worst group. So discontinuing statins is probably having some uh, bad effects. So this should be always in our minds. And final part is what do the guidelines say? Actually, the guidelines, which the European guidelines, which were published in 2019, are quite impressive guidelines. And they also focus all the time on the total risk estimation. Whenever I'm seeing a patient, I have to risk estimate such a patient. And total risk estimation, it's a plus one level of evidence C, using a risk estimation system, such as the SCORE system, is recommended for asymptomatic adults 40 years of age or more, without evidence of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, familial hypercholesterolemia, or an LDL cholesterol above 190 milligrams per deciliter. It is recommended as well that high and very high risk individuals are identified on the basis of documented cardiovascular disease, diabetes, moderate to severe renal disease, very high levels of individual risk factors, familial hypercholesterolemia, or a high score risk. It is recommended that such patients are considered as a priority for advice and management of all risk factors, and this is also a plus one level of evidence C. And we know that here for Egypt, we're using the high risk score uh, because actually Egypt is classified uh, as one of the countries at high risk. But we know as well that there are some factors which are not calculated in the risk score. And these factors may actually be contributing to some uh, of the problems that we may be seeing. And such modifiers for the score risk include social deprivation, the presence of obesity and definitely central obesity in particular, physical inactivity, psychosocial stress, the presence of a family history of a cardiovascular, the premature cardiovascular disease. And by premature, we mean men under the age of 55 or women under the age of 60 years, as well as the presence of chronic immune mediated inflammatory disorders. Other major modifiers as well are major psychiatric disorders, treatment of HIV, atrial fibrillation, LVH, chronic kidney disease, obstructive sleep apnea, non-alcoholic pathology, and different other modifiers. And these are the how we categorize our patients' cardiovascular risk categories. Includes very high risk patients, including documented atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, either clinical or unequivocal on imaging. And by cardiovascular disease, we mean coronary artery disease or peripheral vascular disease or ischemic stroke. A calculated score more than 10 for 10 years risk of fatal cardiovascular disease is also classified as a very high risk, as well as the presence of familial hypercholesterolemia with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or with another major risk factors. High risk individuals on the other hand include markedly elevated single risk factor, uh, patients with familial hypercholesterolemia without other major uh, risk factors, patients with diabetes, um, without target organ damage, with diabetes duration more than 10 years, 10 years or more, or another additional risk factor, as well as those having moderate uh, chronic kidney disease or a calculated risk score between uh, five, um, five or more, but less than 10 for 10 year risk for fatal cardiovascular disease. We also sometimes do arterial carotid or femoral plaque burden to, on ultrasonography. 
And this should be considered as a risk modifier in individuals who are at low or moderate risk. A coronary calcium score is sometimes also done to check for uh, as a risk modifier in patients who are at uh, low to moderate risk to whether to check whether the patient will be eligible to be given a statin therapy or not. What are we going to request for lipid analysis? Total cholesterol, of course. HDL cholesterol, definitely. LDL cholesterol is recommended as the primary lipid analysis for screening, diagnosis, and management. And triglyceride analysis should be recommended as a part of the routine lipid analysis. Okay, now we have a patient. What should we be doing for him? We go for a total cardiovascular risk assessment and we check for the baseline LDL cholesterol. In selected patients having low or moderate risk, we sometimes use the risk modifiers, including imaging, some looking for subclinical atherosclerosis for risk reclassification. Then we go for to check whether there is an indication for drug therapy or not. If there is an indication, we have to define treatment goals and then give high intensity statin at highest recommended tolerable dose to reach the goal. And we check whether the LDL goal was reached or not. On the other hand, if there was no, so we check for, li we recommend lifestyle advice, lifestyle intervention, and we follow up. If on high potency statin, the patient did not reach the goal, what we go for is adazetamide and then recheck the LDL goal. If not reached, we may be considering giving a PCSK9. The recommendation for pharmacological uh, treatment for low-density lipoprotein, it's a, recommend, it's a class one level of evidence A, uh, to prescribe a high-intensity statin, as mentioned, up to the highest tolerated dose to reach the goal set for the specific level of risk. For secondary prevention, patients at very high risk not achieving their goals on maximum tolerated dose of statin and ezetimibe, a combination with a PCSK9 inhibitor is recommended. If a statin, on the other hand, is not tolerated at any dose, even after a re-challenge, a PCSK9 uh, inhibitor added to ezetimibe may be considered, and this is a class 2B. And this is a very interesting slide from the guidelines, actually showing the relation between if the patient is having very high risk, high risk, moderate risk, low risk, and the levels of LDL cholesterol we should be achieving in such patients. Uh, for instance, if the patient is at very high risk, the recommendation is to have the LDL cholesterol below 55 milligram per deciliter and reducing the LDL cholesterol by 50%, at least 50% reduction from baseline. If the patient at a high risk, the recommended LDL cholesterol is below 70 milligrams per deciliter, uh, in addition to reducing the, uh, significantly the LDL. What should we ex be expecting if we give high-intensity statin? And what are the expectations whenever we're giving different medication types that lower LDL cholesterol? Actually, if you give high-intensity statin, we are expecting that the LDL cholesterol will be reduced by approximately 50%. If we give, in addition to this, high-intensity statin, we give azetamide, we expect that the LDL cholesterol should be reduced by approximately 65%. On the other hand, we may be expecting up to 85% reduction in the LDL cholesterol if we give a PCSK9 inhibitor plus high-intensity statin plus azetamide. In patients, on the other hand, having acute coronary syndrome, all patients without any contraindication or definite history of intolerance to statin, it is recommended to initiate or continue high-dose statin as early as possible, regardless of the initial LDL value. It is also recommended that routine pretreatment or loading on the background of chronic therapy with high-dose statin should be considered in patients undergoing PCI for an acute coronary syndrome or elective PCI. And this is a class 2A indication. On the other hand, patients with a history of ischemic stroke or TIA are at a very high risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, particularly current ischemic strokes. So it is recommended that they receive intensive lipid lowering therapy, and this is a class one level of evidence A. This is quite an impressive slide. 
because it's actually showing the absolute reductions in major vascular events with statin therapy. The higher the risk the patient is having, the more impressive will be the absolute reductions in major vascular events if the patients are giving statin therapy. And my key home messages are that current guidelines acknowledge the importance of treating cholesterol to reduce atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk. This lipidemia guidelines are aligned on the one concept, which is statin intensity according to the patient's risk. And finally, evidence for statin exists for both primary and secondary prevention. Thank you very much.